Hey all, we're here with Physicians for a National Health Program. We're going to be talking about the future of U.S. healthcare. Sit back and enjoy. Greetings. I'm Betty Keller from the Vermont Physicians for a National Health Program. We're all in this together, and today we'll be talking about learning about healthcare reform. I'm really excited to have four interns with me today. The Physicians for a National Health Program um, is a national organization. Um, Vermont has a chapter, and we educate and uh, educate about healthcare reform and specifically trying to get an efficient healthcare system for the whole country and uh, advocate for it as well. Um, but the education part is really critical because people won't understand um, what, what the different options are and why having an, an integrated coordinated system is so much more efficient. It provides better care, better access, better outcomes at lower cost. Um, and until we really educate people about that, we're going to have troubles achieving it. So uh, we have an internship in the summer that is usually focused on having medical students. So students who finish their first year of medical school and um, have a summer off before they go back to the classroom. And then after that, they're in the clinicals and they will not have a summer off again. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> but I'd like to introduce now our interns this summer. We have um, three from medical schools in Louisiana and one from a medical school in Arkansas. So Gregor Dirks is on my immediate left. He is from the um, Louisiana State University in Shreveport, but actually from Oregon. Right. Okay. And Proud, so, proudly from Portland, Oregon. <laughs> all right. All right. And that's what Das is from the um, Arkansas College of Osteopathic Medicine, and actually from Arkansas. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. Siobhan Temple is from Louisiana State University in Shreveport, and actually from Louisiana. She's New, from Orleans. New Orleans. It's different. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yep. Okay, great. And uh, also we have um, Benjamin McMahon, who is at, um, studying at Tulane University and from Florida. Thank yep. you for being here today. So I'm going to start off with just first asking, um, if you, just, if you could be thinking about how did you happen to hear about the internship and what made you decide to follow up and apply for it? Um, maybe we could start with um, Benjamin, if you could speak about that? Sure, yeah. I mean, my experience, and to keep it kind of brief, I did a lot of research after undergrad, um, clinical research. And within medical school, there isn't a lot of health policy education. There just isn't so much time for it in the first two years. We're learning a lot of the aspects and basic sciences of being a physician. So I kind of wanted to spend the summer learning a bit more about health policy and specifically single payer, learning more about what that entails and becoming an advocate of it. How I heard about it, uh, Tulane sent out an email. Betty here has reached out uh, across the nation, I think, to get some of the most qualified candidates to join. Uh, we're really appreciative of that. Um, but yeah, really kind of just down from Betty to my school. And I was like, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity to learn more about how I want the future of healthcare to look. Thank you, Benjamin. Siobhan, do you have any comments? Yes, uh, for me, I will, well, so I heard about the program via my uh, email server because Dr. Keller emailed out, reached out to a bunch of schools, and as soon as I saw the opportunity, I was like, you know, I wanted to jump on it because, as Ben said, we don't get to uh, learn about health policy while in med school for real, and it's a subject dear to my heart because I've had two young friends that have been, I don't know if I should call them victims of the system, but like have been affected gravely by uh, the current healthcare system. And one has led in a death and the other has led in her almost going bankrupt at 28. So, you know, I really, mm -hmm. it means a lot to me to like, you know, learn how to become a better advocate so we can really, you know, because we need a change. I think that's obvious. Thank you. So, Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I, I heard about like PNHP just through the Twitter space, like Dr. Adam Gaffney is really big on that and so follow him and check him out. But um, And so then I went on the website and for under Arkansas it says so I just contact the home, like the headquarters. So I just shot a brief email and I guess they just forwarded it to Betty and so then I got in contact with Betty. Thank you. Yeah. Um... Same story as everyone else, pretty much. I got an email from our school, seemed really interesting. It was like a rerouted email from Betty. And uh, Siobhan and I had like just been talking about what we wanted to do for the summer. Got an email, we both signed up immediately. Um, and I also feel very passionately that our current system is just embarrassingly broken, so we need something new. And I think that single payer is kind of the way to go. Thank so. you, thank you. So maybe you could um, talk a little bit more, Gregor, about 
what experiences have you made decide made you decide that our current system is broken? Um, so I've for everyone in the circle, I've talked about this before, but I uh, volunteer. This is one one example. I volunteered at Mission of Mercy. Everyone on screen watching should all do it. Um, it's dental, it's not medical, so it's a little bit different. But basically, um, it's the three days leading up to Thanksgiving, and it's all free dental care for about 12 hours a day for those three days. Everything from teeth pulling, teeth cleaning, to more more intense stuff like implants and all that, and dentures and everything else. Um, and so all of these people that come in are either completely uninsured or totally underinsured, which is essentially sort of the same thing as being uninsured. You can't use your insurance because it's too expensive. Um, so you end up seeing the patients at their absolute worst rather than allowing them to come in regularly and get their teeth clean, get whatever needs fixing early when it's a minor issue. And then you see these patients coming in and their teeth are literally like literally crumbling out of out of their skull. You can take pliers and pull their teeth out without any anesthesia because they're completely rotten. And so it's that is sort of just a little window into if you treat people not frequently in their most extreme and worst state, then it ends up costing a lot more time wise, commitment wise, money wise than if you just treat them early and give everyone equal access to care. And plus, so. you actually, in that case, you have worse outcomes because they also don't have any teeth at the end. Right. They're using dentures instead of having fixed their teeth earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And so most people are underinsured for dental care because they don't have dental insurance coverage on most policies. It's actually very uncommon. You should have to pay for an additional dental insurance on top of your other insurance. Um, Saswat, do you have specific um, experiences you care to share about what made you decide to be following Adam Gaffney? Um, I mean, the biggest one was, so after Obamacare, I was allowed on my parents' insurance plan until 26. Uh, but my dad actually went down to Texas and got a job with Texas. Um, and so his insurance plan switched, and I obviously switched because I didn't, I wanted to be under my parents because his is much better than what I could find. Um, but the problem which I eventually found out was uh, in my network, since I'm in Arkansas, the nearest primary care doc is uh, three hours away from me. And so it's basically like having no insurance since I can't see a doctor. To be anyways. in network. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Because he has a mostly Texas network rather than an Arkansas one. So that's interesting. So when people talk about, oh, we want choice, we want to have choice in our, what are they talking about? Their healthcare, their insurance company? Can you talk a little bit about the, that? Yeah, I, I think right now when we hear about freedom and choice, uh, people immediately think like healthcare insurance, but there's kind of a disconnect between healthcare and insurance. So when you talk about choice, is it the choice of like what card you have, what color that card is, stuff like that, or is it the choice of what doctor you want to see, where do you want to go for your care, things like that. And so I feel like a single payer actually gives people more choice rather than less choice because mm -hmm. you're allowed to just go in, uh, into a clinic. I have to look up which clinic I'm allowed to go to. Otherwise, I'd have like a $1,000 bill that I just can't pay as a student. Mm -hmm. And can I add on that really to let Ben speak about it? But we just experienced being up here, that type of situation. So, uh, Yeah, so I likely contracted Lyme disease. We're up here. I'm an outdoor person. Um, so we had a long day yesterday and Gregor graciously drove me to the clinic to go and get my prescription that was filled by one of the physicians here. So we go there and I have my insurance with Blue Cross Blue Shoe in Louisiana um, and I'm a student as well so funds are tight. So it's for doxycycline which is very cheap to make. I don't know specific numbers but... Um, it's been around a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very standard antibiotic. Um, and so we got to, the, got to the pharmacy and they said, oh, we don't accept that insurance here. I'm like, okay, great. How much is that going to be then? For a two-week regimen, $75 for doxycycline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's the irony there. Thanks for the lead, Siobhan. Yeah. The irony is just, wow, like, I, I'm not going to pay that. I, and it's for the most routine antibiotic we have. And it's... And, and so having this private insurance choice, choice for your father to buy the insurance plan at work, for instance, and in your case, having your insurance in right. in Louisiana. Well, since so Saswa spoke to underinsurance, which is a whole other issue too, and this could be an example of underinsurance, or it could just be a product of the confusing 
convoluted system we have. And that's also kind of why we're here is it's easy to see it's too expensive. It's easy to see people, um, we all have examples of it not working. Part of the reason why I'm here is it's just so confusing. Our system we have now, it's some people, you might be able to pay for it, but you have no idea where you can go, who you can see, what it's going to cost when you go to the emergency department, you get a surgery, is this surgeon on my network? Are they here? How much is this going to cost? And I think it's just, it takes so much mental energy um, that we're losing resources, not just financially, just in productivity in our daily, because people have no idea where they can go. Thank you for mentioning the, the drain on us as individuals that nobody in Canada, France, mm -hmm. UK, Taiwan, Australia, Germany, None of those people have to worry about is this doctor in network or not. None of them, as far as I know, none of them have deductibles. In your studies, if you found that any of the countries that you studied had anything called a deductible, it's, it's totally a product for the, of the United States insurance companies to figure out how to collect your premiums and then only pay out after you've paid for most of your health care yourself and like limit the likelihood of you actually wanting to get health care because you can't afford you know, the health healthcare until you meet your deductible. Mm -hmm. So it's really a way to maximize their profits, collecting your premiums and minimizing how often they actually have to pay out on something that they, they call a medical loss. To provide you the product that you've paid for, they call it a medical loss, and they're trying to limit their medical losses. Yeah, and even to speak on my experience, like I went to the doctor earlier, well, I went to the doctor last year, and I ended up getting a bill. And mind you, I'm in medical school, I'm swamped. So I kind of put off calling the insurance company. I finally do that. I was on the phone with them for maybe an hour and a half, only to then have to get off the phone to call my doctor to tell them they uh, coded the ICD code wrong. And then they're busy, so they're like, okay, we'll handle it. So like now I think six months have elapsed and I had to like beg the insurance company to not put this on my credit because like I can't help that the doc, like I can't do anything about the code. So even frustrations like that, and I'm an educated person, like, you know, and I'm in medical school and I'm like frustrated with the situation. I can't imagine, you know, your average person who doesn't even know what an ICD, you know, code is and like, you know, feels mm -hmm. hopeless and like doesn't know what if to anyone, do. If anyone, we should know where to go. Yeah, and we, have no and we idea. don't know where to go, yeah. so there's clearly a problem. Oh my gosh, so on the same vein, I was going in for a routine, annual, physical, getting the normal things that women get, and yeah, as well as the tests like cholesterol, that sort of thing, and looked up in advance which things were supposed to be covered, and also called my Blue Cross Blue Shield to see what other things they covered, but there's a difference between, oh, is it covered as preventive care that you get for free under Obamacare, or is it covered by your health plan but it goes toward a deductible first? And when I was communicating with the billing and the lab and the doctor's office, they were all using the word coverage differently, and I basically came away think, believing that, these, that the things the doctor was ordering were going to be covered under the preventive care. And, and another study that is age-based, um, but my insurance company said that it's covered, but not until you, but it goes, goes toward a deductible and the preventive doesn't cover it until you hit a certain age that was older than what my doctor thought. <laughs> so they so come away with hundreds of dollars of bills that you're not expecting. Ah, uh, dear. So um, I, I think everybody's had a chance to talk a little bit about then some experiences of where you felt it was broken. So how would you like to improve our system? Saswat, would you like to start with that? Um, yeah, so part of our internship, we got to study different countries and kind of how they were able to do it. And one of the thing, one of the countries I chose to study was uh, Taiwan, which is a pretty recent phenomenon. They only changed it in 1992, um, so not that long ago compared to like the NHS, which is mm -hmm. like 100 years, and Germany with another 100 years. So like, if we want to transition today, they would probably be the best example of the most recent transition in like our current times. Mm -hmm. And they were able to do a single payer without you know the fears of Canada being like, oh, wait times, because they virtually have no wait times. It's probably the least in the entire country. Their administrative cost is only 2% compared to our like ridiculous number because of just how much technology they had at the time. Kind of just learning from other countries that I've tried. And I think that's something important for us to look at is looking at other countries because the U.S. healthcare system is just not working mm -hmm. and hasn't been working for a long time now. So I think it's time to start looking at other examples. 
Mm -hmm. I think Taiwan is really interesting because most of the other uh, national health care services across other countries have kind of grown organically. Um, and Taiwan's was like a calculated, they brought in experts to do research, they compared a whole bunch of other countries, they brought in all these people, made a task, a literal task force to implement decisively the best healthcare that they possibly could, given mm -hmm. the information that they had. Right, so some people in Vermont may remember that we had Dr. Shao come and, and assess how much it would cost um, to do a, a single payer system in Vermont, and he had been one of the, the experts brought in to help design the program at Taiwan, in, in Taiwan. Right. So, um, so you were talking about the uh, the administrative cost being only two percent in in their system. Mm -hmm. One of the valuable things of looking at other countries is that whenever there's an argument that it's not very fact based, or there's people pulling out facts that disagree with each other, <laughs> um, a recent fact that's been thrown around is the facts people have been throwing around have been around how much does Medicare cost to administer, and how much does private health insurance cost to man, man, administer. And uh, numbers have been thrown around between 2% and 5% for Medicare and then scare about, oh, but that doesn't cover like how much they do for this or that that comes from other places like, oh, the legislators, you should take a percentage out of theirs. And one of the, <laughs> one of the, um, one of the, these arguments was you should take out 10% of the legislators uh, salaries and consider that toward how much it costs to run Medicare. It's like, you think they spend 10% of their time on Medicare, seriously? And somebody um, wrote a rebuttal about the fact that, um, well, the collections and the fraud stuff is actually built in to the numbers that Medicare says it spends. Um, but if you're having confusions around that, you can also look at what other countries do. And when they seriously only have one payer, so they don't have to have all the administrative waste in the hospitals, in the doctor's offices, in the businesses with their, with their HR departments, trying to help their employees get their actual coverage after they have gotten, you know, paid for their insurance. Um, all that extra administrative waste isn't even counted when you're talking about administrative waste in America. And um, if we would have the guts to look at other countries and, and say, well, if, if Taiwan can do it for 2%, are we not as smart? Are we not as honest? I mean, what, what is it that we can't do as well as them? I also think it might be important to explain a little more what administrative waste really is, because it is a word, a phrase that's thrown around a lot, but it's hard to really see the dollars where that is. Mm -hmm. So just for example, I think w when you go to the doctor's office, and you go to pay your bill, there can sometimes be six or seven um, people dedicated to working with different insurance companies. Humana, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, a litany of them. So on salary, those people are being paid to then deal with you, with your uh, BCPS, to go and fax that and deal with that company. While you have six other people on payroll just waiting to deal with the other company. And I think it's important to realize that's where this waste is coming from, is so many resources dedicated to all these different companies, both from financial and a, just a confusing aspect of this too much. Like, it's just too much going on, and with a single pair system, it's streamlined. And mm -hmm. just a little bit more at the financial aspect, yes, um, taxes go up a little bit, and I'm sure we'll detail that in a bit. They inevitably will have to. But administrative costs go down. The cost of you going to see the doctor goes down. You can see the doctor more often. Um, so I just, I think it's really important to, because it's always, especially with the debates going on, they say taxes will go up, you'll pay more. Not really. You'll pay more a little bit in that initial statement, but then you won't when you go in to see the doctor. Well, there's a big point, though. Does anybody want to speak to your taxes will go up, but what will go down? Yeah, your mm -hmm. premium costs, and that's what I was going right. to mention. Like, and the money going towards health care. Like, right now, our health care, what is that, 18.6 GDP, whatever it is, it's high. And a lot of that money doesn't even go to adequate health care. Like, mm -hmm. we still have poor health outcomes. We have, what, the highest infant maternal mortality rate? Even of, the, of the developed countries. Of the developed countries, yeah. And um, the highest medications in di like paying for diabetic medications or whatever medications have you. Our life expectancy has gone, gone down. Other countries are our life expectancy going continues up. to go up, and ours mm -hmm. is going down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that money, a lot of that money is going to like you know the C the 
administrator administration and the insurance companies but not to our better health care so like that is another thing to talk about as well like we the money should be used for us to make sure our health care is like efficient an efficient system and like the multi-payer system clearly is not doing that right now or the for-profit insurance companies are not doing that so does somebody want to talk about all the different places that we spend our money right now that goes toward health care Maybe I'm not asking that in a very good way. But for um, I mean, we can just start listing things. So, like, obviously, you're going to spend your money in healthcare on, like, actual health care. So, like, your hospitals, your clinics, your doctors, nurses, staff, things like that. But then there's also this huge other bubble that we spend in our health care. Pharmaceutical companies that make huge profits. All the insurance companies, when we pay our premiums, deductibles, like the profits that ins every insurance company makes, um, all of their staff, all of their workers, and not only that, but then you have like in the doctor's office, you're the people that can like bill all the billing that's mm -hmm. done since every insurance company is like different. Yeah. So you still like have to get training and then all the coding that you have to do and all these other right. additional, if anyone else wants to mention. So else. even outside of that healthcare realm there, if you're looking at your family budget, where else is money paying for healthcare? So for instance, when you're paying your property taxes, um, when you're paying your property taxes, you're paying for the town employees, their health insurance. Mm -hmm. And the school employees, all those teachers, we have all those negotiations around health insurance. Those negotiations would go away if they all had health insurance. Yeah, you wouldn't probably. have teachers striking over the health mm -hmm. insurance, mm -hmm. okay? Um, are, are you familiar with other places? How about in your, in your, um, when you're purchasing products? So say you're buying a car. A certain percent of that is to pay for the, all the health insurance for all those employees. Mm. So our price is higher on our cars mm. that we're right. competing with other countries. Yeah, Dr. Deb Richter was talking about that yesterday, and I didn't understand that. I didn't like. I remember she was saying property taxes would go down, but I didn't understand that component that you're explaining right, right. now. Right, because yeah. because oh you're not paying for the teachers. So mm. and and how about car insurance? Right now you have car insurance that pays for replacing the car if somebody hits your car and your car is totaled. But how about your health care? You don't have to worry about whether they did or didn't have good car insurance. You can still get your health care. Right. Mm -hmm. And you don't have, when you're buying your insurance, you don't have to pay extra for all that amount for um, comprehensive in case you um, hurt somebody because, um, because it's, you know, they'll be covered. Yeah, and workers' comp will go away too then in that Absolutely. Facet. Yeah, absolutely right. Right. So there are many places, and, and also, of course, on your, on your paycheck, they take away the Medicare and, and the Medicaid um, expenditures to, yeah. to be collecting for the system. So there are many places that you're paying for health care already, but you're just not. You don't know. We don't just think not about it, it like that. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're paying for all this health care for so many people. And in, in your taxes, you're paying for all the great health care that the senators and and um, representatives get <laughs> and the president gets. They, I don't even know whether they have deductibles. If they do, it's probably very lower than maybe they have secondary insurance. But they have excellent health insurance. And we're paying for them to have great insurance on our taxes, but we still aren't getting good insurance. Yeah. And then, yeah, so you mentioned like there are all these different like aspects, but another thing is like small businesses that have to cover their employees, like if, if the government funds that, then that's a huge tax break to the small businesses as well, and they can do however they see fit. They Wages can, can go business, up. And they, yeah. yeah, they can give it because to the workers and actually have money to spend. I learned that we can't negotiate wages right now because of we're paying so much money in healthcare because premiums keep going up and, well, premiums keep going up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if your employer is paying part of that for you, then, you know, you can have more wiggle room to um, negotiate raises right. and wages. What would have been your raise is actually just paying It's going your to your health interest. That right. you're not even, like, you know, people think even with their good insurance, I'm sure, like, you know, there's still a lot of um, issues with it that they might not necessarily be aware of. Right. Right. So when the uh, when the moderator on one of these debates um, asks, so um, would you, you know, as a candidate for the president of the United States, would you take would you force everybody to go on a government run plan or would you still let private insurance happen? What do you think about the language that they're using when they do that? I mean, they're, they're clearly painting the government plan in a kind of a negative light. And uh, so, like, we have this whole idea of, like, you know, the free market is the best place, like, the jungle for pre creating the best products and the best care and all that stuff, but it really doesn't apply to healthcare um, as far as, like, market econ economics is concerned. But the, the language is always geared towards um, 
putting down the government plan, which is strange because people love Medicare, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and the, then yeah. I was going to say, and the other thing is like they're always saying abolish private insurance, but then if you look at any of the like single payer proposals out now, it's like the private insurance system still exists. It just can't compete and cover the things that the Medicare improved Medicare would cover. So it would still be like a supplemental like for cosmetic surgeries or maybe like any other thing. Oh, for thing. things that are not the basic yeah. services. Any, that are anything yeah. that's not something you necessarily need, mm -hmm. you can still buy insurance. Right. Yeah. But you don't get the savings of the single payer mm -hmm. insurance, com uh, the single payer system, if you have multiple competing insurances for those basic health care needs because you're still having all that administrative waste behind there. So for the things that are covered by the, by the public plan, and we used to always call it public. It's a new thing to call it, like new in the last 20 or 30 years, since, an ins since the insurance companies did surveys and, and messaging and trying to figure out how can we taint people's <laughs> feelings <Yeah>. about <laughs> public, public health care, like Medicare. Are you saying um, they use rhetoric to sway public opinion? Oh, they purposely. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> Not actual facts? Yeah, yeah. And so just using the, if, to use the word government run and compare that to um, private and Private insurance is already tainting it because you should say publicly Public. run and private insurance, or you should say government run and corporate run, because that would be a more fair comparison. Yeah. Go government run or corporate run. You know, something where you have some control and some transparency and accountability, or corporate run, where you have no control. Yeah, or no transparency right. at all. Right, the transparency is a huge thing, and that would be important in, if we do get a, when? When we do get a reasonable healthcare system, we will still need to be making sure that it's transparent and accountable, because you could certainly make a corrupt system that didn't meet our needs and have the good outcomes and, and low cost that we're looking for. Yeah. So we just have a little bit of time left. I'm wondering, do, do any of you have a, a last thing you wanted to make sure you said here on our show today? Do you, I say no. I don't know. I'll, I'll go for it. Okay, okay thank it. you. So we, we talk a lot about if healthcare is a right or not, and that's something you have to decide within yourself. and. Um, We've been considering it over the past four weeks, I think, and we sort of deduce that within the American healthcare system right now, to live is, is a right. To put an example to that, if you have a catastrophic event, an ambulance will pick you up and take you to the ER and you'll live. But getting better is not a right in the American healthcare system. All the other places, you have the right to get better. You have the right to not worry about finances and access to both live and improve your health. Here right now, they say, oh yeah, ambulance will pick you up, you'll survive that heart attack, you'll, um, we'll stop that bleed, but we can't control your diabetes, which we know you will die from if you don't have access to help. We can't, you know, if you can't afford the chemo, um, sorry, I mean, take it out of your grandchildren's budget, take it out of, reduce your savings, get on Medicaid, do your best. Or they'll do it like you have the heart attack and you go to the hospital and you get this triple bypass surgery and then you're left with this huge bill that you can't afford to pay exactly. and you either foreclose your house or like again with my friend who I can speak about who had cancer, you know, people think like, oh, it'll help the poor people, but she was a middle working, like, you know, making at least like 50,000 working at Enterprise and got cancer, breast cancer, went through chemo. Chemo calls her not to be able to work anymore. Her job laid her off, so she no longer had insurance, couldn't get Medicaid because she didn't qualify for Medicaid, and mm. was left with this huge bill, like at 28 years old. Mm. And now, like, you know, she was on a track to buying a house, can't do that anymore, like, you know. And it's just oh. unfortunate that that places our youth even in situations like this, not to mention people with families. And, you know, I really think that should speak on, like, we have to do something. Like, it's affecting everyone. It's not just, like, the poor. Like, it's, every, it's your middle-class person. It's your neighbor, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, all of you, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope this was informative. If you have any questions, please visit pnhp.org and healthcare-now.org.